Welcome back to Ben and Mine. On this channel, we talk about things on the deeper, darker depths of this world. We bring them to the surface and better explain them so you don't have to fear them anymore. In this video, we're going to be talking about a case that has plagued America for 65 years and what has finally led up to a big break in the case. That's right, in this video, we're going to be talking about the boy in the box. It was a cold February day in Fox Chase, Philadelphia. The year was 1957 and February 25th. John Palmernzik, I apologize for that, that's a very hard name to pronounce, had been out riding his bike checking his muskrat traps. He was disappointed as he hadn't had any luck that year. When he was out checking the traps, he couldn't help but notice a rather large cardboard box. Littering was common around this area as it wasn't unusual to see trash, empty cans, and even appliances on the side of the road. However, this box had recently been placed there as he hadn't seen it before, and it hadn't yet fallen apart from all the damp snow, meaning it had been placed there fairly recently. He parked his bike and walked up to the box. When he attempted to lift the box up, he realized that it was quite heavy, so he peered inside to see what was weighing it down. At first glance, it appeared to be a life-size doll, but who would throw out such a big doll like this, he wondered. However, the more he looked at it, the more lifelike it appeared to be. He soon realized that it was the body of a small boy and biked home disturbed by what he had seen. He didn't tell his parents, as he was afraid he wouldn't be able to trap muskrats out there anymore. A few days later, Frederick Benosis, a 26-year-old college student, was driving along the road when he saw a rabbit running. He knew of the trappers in the area and was rather indifferent to them. He felt that the act of trapping was cruel, so he pulled his car over to look for traps. As he was setting off traps, he noticed the box. It was a large cardboard box from J.C. Penney and it appeared to have a large doll inside of it. After a bit of examination, Frederick realized that this was no doll, and more so, human remains. He was also reluctant to go to the police. However, the next day after hearing about the disappearance of Mary Jane Barker on the radio, he decided to do the right thing and get the authorities involved. Elmer Palmer and Sam Weinstein arrived to the scene. They saw a JCPenney box that was for a bassinet which is like a crib, but smaller. It's specifically designed for newborns. Inside were the remains of a young boy wrapped in a blanket. The police took the body in for examination. The boy was most likely between the ages of four and six. He was three foot, four and a half inches tall and weighed 30 pounds. They also found that the boy's hair had been cut quite recently and might have been cut after the boy died, as there were clumps of hair found on the boy. The boy's body had sustained many bruises all over the body, mostly on the head and face. The palm of his right hand and the soles of both his feet were wrinkled, which suggests that he was submerged in water for an extended period of time before he died. When the boy's gastrointestinal tract was examined, they found that he had not eaten for two to three hours before his death. There were multiple surgical scars in the ankle and groin, along with an L-shaped scar under the chin. When they shined an ultraviolet light on the boy's left eye, it glowed a bright blue, which suggests that a diagnostic dye, such as fluorescein, may have been present. Fluorescein, if you were wondering, is used to check for any corneal or vessel abnormalities. The dye is applied to the eye, and any problems on the surface of the eye will show up green. The cold weather that the body was found in made it difficult to determine how long the boy had been deceased. They estimated that it could have been between two and three days or as much as weeks. The police took the boy's fingerprints and hoped that he would soon be identified. The Philadelphia Inquirer printed 40,000 flyers showing the boy. These flyers were posted all over the area in hopes of someone knowing any information. The box the boy was found in was an important piece of evidence because it could be used to track the person responsible for this crime. It was a box that was for a baby's bassinet that JCPenney sold for $7.50. Between December 3rd, 1956 and February 16, 1957, the box was specifically sold out of the JCPenney store on 100 South 69th Street, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. However, since JCPenney had a cash-only policy at the time, there was no way of tracking down the suspect. Nevertheless, the box was sent to the FBI for analysis in hopes of finding any DNA or fingerprints, but none were found. 
Another important piece of evidence was the blanket that the boy was found wrapped in. It had a plaid design and appeared to have been washed recently. The medical examiner's office brought the blanket to the Philadelphia Textile Institute for testing. They found that the blanket had been made at either Beacon Mill, Swannanoa, North Carolina, or the Esdman Mills in Granby, Quebec, Canada. However, the possibility of tracking down the point of sale was quite slim as thousands of those blankets have been sold to multiple stores across the country. A cap was found around 17 feet where the boy's body was found. It was a royal blue corduroy man's cap with a leather strap and a buckle in the back. The cap was sent to the FBI. Using the cap's label, detectives learned that it was made at the Robbins Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company at 2603 South 7th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The police interviewed the owner of the company, Mrs. Hannah Robbins. She said the cap was one of 12 made from pieces of corduroy sometime before May of 56. She also said that the cap was made without a strap, but the man she sold it to asked to put one on it. She added that the man she sold the cap to bared great resemblance to the photo of the boy on the flyers. When asked to describe in more detail of what this man looked like, she said the man was alone, wore working clothes, didn't speak with a foreign accent, had blonde hair, and appeared to be in his late 20s. There are other items that were also found in the vicinity of the boy. However, I won't go into detail on any of them, as many of them might have been unrelated, as this was a known place for people to dump their trash. I can, however, assure you that none of these miscellaneous items were able to help with finding the identity of this boy. A dark brown substance was found coating the interior of the boy's esophagus, which was similar to vomit. Dr. Joseph W. Spielman, who performed the two-hour autopsy, stated that the boy had been violently murdered by multiple blows of the head. I also wanted to point out that one of the symptoms of a concussion is vomiting. There were dozens and dozens of leads. If I went over all of them, this video would be way over an hour long. So I'm just gonna go over some of the important ones. Stephen Dahman was kidnapped outside a Long Island supermarket on October 31st, 1955, when he was 34 months old. Stephen would have been around the same age as this boy at the time and would have looked similar. However, after comparing the two, police officers started to have doubts. In 2003, investigators re-examined the Dahman case and were able to track down Stephen's sister, who submitted a DNA sample for comparison with the DNA profile of America's unknown child. However, a comparison of the DNA proved conclusively that the unknown boy was not Stephen Dahman. About one and a half miles from where the boy's body was discovered was a foster home. The family running the home were Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti and Anna Marie Nagel, who was Catherine's daughter from a previous marriage. They usually cared for five or six kids at the time, but sometimes as many as 25. In 1960, Remington Bristow, an investigator who was conducting his own investigation into the case, wasn't getting much luck. He went to a psychic in New Jersey named Florence Sternfeld. Florence claimed that she could identify a person by holding a piece of metal that was connected to them. Bristol gave the psychic two staples that came from the box that the boy was found in. Florence told Bristol to look for a large house with a wooden railing and a log cabin on the property that had children playing in it. Bristol went looking for the place she described and eventually stumbled across the foster home. Bristol investigated the foster home and found that it matched the description the psychic had given. In 1961, the home closed down and the Nicoletti family that ran the home moved. When the home was put up for sale, they had an auction for the furniture. Bristol went in for a viewing and while walking around, spotted a bassinet that looked like the one that JCPenney sold. It was in the basement covered in dust, meaning that it hadn't been used in a long time. While walking outside, he saw plaid blankets hanging on the clothesline. He noticed that they had been cut in half to fit the metal beds that the children had slept on. He also spotted a pond and theorized that this was the place where the boy laid before he met his demise. After what Bristol saw on that day, he believed without a doubt that the stone house was linked to this case. After years of trying to get the police to investigate the foster family, they finally came in 1984, and in 1984, two detectives interviewed Arthur Nicoletti. However, the detectives didn't find anything incriminating. Bristol then called Arthur and tried to get him to take a lie detector test, but Arthur refused. Bristol was confident that the Foster family had something to hide. In 1988, while going through police reports, Bristol stumbled across a doctor that had treated the boys in the home. Bristol was hoping that the boy's medical record would be in the doctor's file. He started investigating down that path and found the doctor's wife, who told him that she had destroyed the records five years prior when he passed away. Every path Bristol went down ended in a dead end. However, up until his death in 1993, he never swayed in his belief that the foster home was involved. 
In 2002, the boy in a box case was blown wide open when a person identifying themselves as M came to the police with a confession. The woman claimed that her mom had purchased the boy from another family. She said that the boy was badly abused for two and a half years. She said that her parents had punished the boy after he threw up in a bathtub and that he died after being slammed into the floor. Furthermore, a witness was able to give this story some credit when he stated that he saw women moving a box from the trunk of her car. He asked them if they needed any help and they ignored him. Although this did seem like a strong lead, I must say that Suspect M had a history of mental illness. And when the police pursued this lead, they interviewed some of Suspect M's family who said that they never saw a young boy in the house. That basically concluded the leads that I wanted to cover. There are dozens more that I can go into detail about. However, I feel that it's really unnecessary as the true identity of the boy has been revealed, making some of the leads uninteresting. I felt that it was important to go over the most prominent ones so that you could see just how vast this case was. And now, for the whole reason I'm making this video, his identity. Joseph Augustus Zarelli. In 2019, the boy's body would be exhumed for a second time to collect DNA, and it was this DNA sample that would reveal his identity. On December 8, 2022, Philadelphia authorities announced that DNA testing had revealed the identity of the boy in the box as Joseph Augustus Zarelli. Authorities believe Joseph lived in Philadelphia around 61st Street and Market Street. The Philadelphia police stated that there are still living suspects related to Joseph's murder and that they could still file charges if the person responsible is found. Joseph Augustus Sorelli was born on Tuesday, January 13th, 1953. His parents were Augustus John Zarelli and Mary Elizabeth Plunkett. Both of his parents are deceased. The police are hoping that someone who knows what may have gone on in that household will step forward. However, since it's been 65 years, chances are quite slim. When the headstone over Joseph's grave was first installed, it said America's unknown child. But on January 13th, 2023, which would have been his 70th birthday, a new memorial containing his full name and images was finally unveiled. I honestly I honestly didn't realize how long this video would be when I first started writing the script. I thought it would be 9 minutes at most. However, when I got to the 7th page of writing the script, I realized this was going to be a much bigger video than I had originally anticipated. I was honestly really a taken back by this case. The fact that the boy only lived to be 4 years old and didn't have his identity known for this long is just heartbreaking. It was also just so lovely seeing all of the people that were involved in this case to find out his identity and I just really hope that the search continues to find out who did this. All of the investigators deserve massive credit and I really hope that the suspect is alive so that they can answer for this. I'm really glad that our technology is advancing so that we can continue to solve cases like this. Just seeing everybody come together and work on this is just just really really amazing. Them all coming out, recognizing the grave site every single year but putting flowers on it for someone that had no idea. That's just, I don't know, it just feels so good. As This was really really emotional to do this honestly. It's just so sad. He only lived to be four years old and to imagine the abusive life that he may have lived up until that point. It's just heartbreaking. But as always, I hope you learned something from this video, and I hope that you can rest easy knowing that we are one step closer to solving this case. If you like this video, give it a like, comment down below, I guess what you thought of the video. That's really all I have to say on this case. If we find out the suspect, I will certainly do an update. See you on the other side.